This is season four of Flute Unscripted. Hi, I'm your host, Katie Massad, and I sit down with a new artist every week and share their stories with you. This podcast is brought to you by Flute Center of New York, the marketplace for flutes. Join us, subscribe, rate, and review us. Use this podcast promo code LISTEN for some special deals. Get $50 off any flute or accessory purchase of $4.99 or more and 10% off any sheet music order, including free shipping on all orders over Greg Patillo has always been an unconventional flute player. From his days at conservatory to his brief stint as principal flute, Greg was always looking for something more and for a way to really connect with his audience. While living in San Francisco, he collaborated with artists in the Collaborative Arts Insurgency, a blend of classical hip hop and jazz with performance poetry, folk music, comedy, and dance, and the 16th and Mission Thursday Night. Everything really seemed to fall into place for Greg when he moved to New York City, started performing in the subways and founded his group Project Trio with Eric Stevenson on cello and Peter Seymour on bass. Between his busy touring schedule and dropping his kids off to school, Greg stopped by the Flute Center of New York to share more about his career with me. Um, Greg, thanks for coming in today to the Flute Center. Um, I first heard about you back in 2007, which seems like a very long time ago, uh, when your Inspector Gadget video first posted. And then you actually came um, to NYU a couple years later and did a, a master class for us. I think that was like the beginning of the beatboxing and um, the whole, you know, phase kicking off across the country and everyone becoming fascinated and you taught us how to do it. Um, now that video on YouTube has, I think, over 30 million views. <clears throat> so it's really, really grown and it keeps um, keeps getting interest and people are still loving it. Um, but I wanted to go back to the very beginning Um, because we all kind of know who you are now and um, start when you were in Seattle and then you went to CIM Mm -hmm. and you were actually on the audition trail, which maybe a lot of people don't know. So what was Mm -hmm. that experience like for you? And at that point in your life, did you consider a a different kind of career other than orchestral performing? Uh, I was, I did, I got into CIM. I grew up in Seattle and uh, I was thrilled, but I got to say that I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, where I grew up, even though I studied with a uh, classical teacher, if you will, she used mm-hmm. to play piccolo in the Seattle Symphony, I, I didn't understand the divide between classical and non-classical until I got to college. Uh, I had done a lot of uh, competitions growing up, starting in the seventh grade, and it was all classical, but I played in my high school jazz band, and growing up in the early 90s in Seattle, it was full of grunge right, rock right. players, and that was very hot back in the day. Mm-hmm. And so all of the coolest musicians I knew had like long hair and tattoos and yeah. played in garage bands and stuff. And so I thought when I would go to conservatory, in fact, that everyone would just be trading instruments and hanging out and jamming, and of course, doing all these great classical studies too Mm -hmm. and so that's my fault I was very misinformed (laughs) Uh, and it took me a while frankly to get my act together in conservatory Um, but I did I made a really good go at trying to be an orchestral flute player uh, and I did take some auditions. I even briefly worked in China in right. Guangzhou. Yeah, you were acting uh, principal. Right? I was for a couple of months, and um, and I was doing auditions kind of locally around the Cleveland area. I did something down in Florida. I flew a couple of places mm-hmm. to do auditions, uh, and I I advanced a, a number of times, but I never won. And I was getting really frustrated, kind of feeling in charge of my career when it was such at the mercy of others. Yeah. And like, there's not a lot of feedback. Like, you might feel like you play great on the audition and then they just cut you mm-hmm. and you don't know why. And frankly, you just, your playing might not even be what they're looking for, even if you play amazing. Um, and so uh, I started playing flute initially. Uh, with Suzuki lessons. I started in my in my fourth grade band class, but I begged my mom for private lessons and I got Suzuki lessons. And Suzuki he- uh, heavily trains the ear. 
And so as a great party trick in middle school, I could always play pop tunes on my flute for my friends. I would love to figure them out. You could play them without sheet music. Right. And so as I grew older, I always had this going on as well. I could just show up and jam. I wasn't really well versed in jazz or anything. I knew my classical theory, but not necessarily my jazz theory. Yeah. This was before the internet, so you couldn't really teach yourself this stuff yeah. unless you got a book or had a teacher. Um, and so as I got out of college and I went to grad school as well at CIM I uh, found myself doing all sorts of different things I played in a little bluegrass band I played in a salsa band in Cleveland I found pickup jazz work uh, and I was doing like classical-esque weddings and things like this (laughs) you know Um, and so like I can sound pretty if I care to Mm -hmm. but more and more I was getting more action doing the non-pretty stuff Mm -hmm. just rocking out on the flute and I, uh, uh, after I left China, I declined the job. Um, I, and I came back to the States, not sure what I was going to be up Why to. Why did you decline the job? Uh, because, uh, I was in a city of, you know, north of 10 million people mm-hmm. and maybe arguably one of the best flute players in that city. And I couldn't stand that. Like, I felt like I still had a lot more growth to do yeah. and I didn't know if I would grow on my own there without anyone else to inspire mm-hmm. me. And it was very foreign, obviously. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, I had a hard time kind of adjusting over there. And um, uh, so when I came back, I, I messed around Cleveland another year. And what I did was I sold all of my possessions and got a one-way ticket to San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Having never been there before, I just moved to San Francisco. And I decided I'm in my mid-20s. I play music. Mm -hmm. I'm passionate about it. I want to go to the coolest place I can think about and just rock out. And uh, I was surprised to find when I moved to San Francisco how broke I was. (laughs) And It's also not a cheap city. (laughs) Well, right. And, And so... All of my ideas, like, oh, I'll audition for orchestras out there, I'll teach lessons, um, these became totally impossible goals because I couldn't even afford a nice apartment. So no mom's going to bring her kid to my place. Right. It was nasty. My roommates were weird, yeah. you know? And uh, I ran out of money real quick, and I had to get a square job. I worked at a grocery store, mm-hmm. Trader Joe's. And so then I was working nights. So then I couldn't even do any pickup classical work at all I couldn't do wed- I couldn't do anything and um, but what I did find there was a really rowdy crew of uh, poets kind of slam poetry if you will uh, and people that could freestyle and beatbox and there were some musicians and every Thursday night uh, they would go into the mission district which is kind of a Back then, it was a little bit seedy. 16th and Mission, there's a BART station, and there's a little park on top there, a little cement plaza, pretty much. Uh, And we would have an open mic every Thursday night. And it was uh, no sign-up sheet or anything like this, and no one was the guy that ran it or anything. Um, But if you came with something cool, you could present. If you could, once someone was done, the next person onto the quote-unquote stage Mm -hmm. or curb could go next. And it was this amazing, passionate uh, collective of people dying for an audience, you know? And, uh, And I met these guys and I was like, yo, let me bring my flute. And they all thought that was super lame, (laughs) you know? And I was like, no, 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 I'll try to make it cool. Like, I'll try to impress you guys. Uh, And uh, I was hearing a lot of beatbox. I knew a bunch of tricky covers and stuff. Like, I knew how to do Super Mario Brothers back Mm -hmm. then without the beatbox, but with, like, a couple of extra sounds. Uh, And I found my groove. I found some people. I found a place to perform. And I found that I could make all these sounds and work on it and perform every week. And so that actually gave rise to this idea that maybe I can actually beatbox on the flute and I totally was willing to just leave the classical stuff behind that yeah because it wasn't working for me right I mean like I just wasn't finding any money or any way forward but uh and although there wasn't any money in this either I was learning <laughs> new skills mm-hmm. and I was finding an audience and kind of chipping away at what later then be my sound mm-hmm. and then I met my uh, future wife out there 
she was part of this crew and she got into school at NYU actually and we moved across the country and oh, I started right. I was going to ask you what made you move from well, that's San what Francisco I did. So about, to Brooklyn that was about 2005 and we drove across the country wow. in her truck and um, I started over again we yeah. had a nicer place than I had in San Francisco mm-hmm. but not that great and yeah. again I needed square jobs New York's yep. more expensive than San Francisco yeah and so uh um, eventually I got a job in, uh, at Trader Joe's again, uh, at Union Square. They opened up the first one right as I was here. And, uh, I gotta say, even though I worked all these square jobs, I, I was still so passionate about music before work, after work, mm-hmm. I was playing the flute. Now it's hard to do a two hour Tafanil Gobert warm up and stuff like yeah, this. Yeah. Like you just want to rock out a little bit, you know, your time becomes really precious. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would bring my flute to work and during my lunch break, they make you take an hour lunch, which they don't pay you for. And so I would go into the subways and that's kind of where I developed my subway set, I called it, um, which was about 45 minutes of beatbox flute, which is what uh, I put on the internet. Uh, back when that was like a novel thing yeah and the reason why i did that was because i was i had business cards and i like kind of produced my own little cds that Mm -hmm. i burned on my macbook you know i put little stickers on it and stuff i sold it for five bucks and was just trying to make a name for myself and i wanted my music to be googleable yeah which was like a hard thing to go about back in the day and um So I found an NYU student, a film school student, and I did some work for her projects. And then she gave me about 45 minutes in the studio where she just turned on the camera and let it let me do my thing. Mm -hmm. And then she helped me put those videos up on the Internet. And I just did it so that people could like Google me. Right. And then it ended up being like uh, uh, insanely lucky for me that, that I did that because Really, that gave birth to my entire career, Mm -hmm. and it's probably why you've even heard about me. Greg came onto the scene at just the right time in the history of YouTube, and views of his videos took off. Greg capitalized on the success of his street performance style and brought it onto the stage with Project Trio, with their upbeat songs, engaging sets, and the thread of storytelling weaved throughout their performances. They want to pass down what they've learned to young musicians and founded their own program in 21st century chamber music and entrepreneurship. Greg and his group continue to push the envelope and inspire. Well, I love that everything you've done is kind of born out of necessity and and that it's worked in your favor. Um, it's kind of great the things that you've been dealt and the things you kind of had to learn on the fly or come up with. And um, I also like how you kind of talk about earning uh, an audience or trying to get them to come to you and, and being grateful that people are listening to you. I think that's something that classical players take for granted um, is that you think you'll always have a full house at a concert and that there'll always be people there. And so you kind of just become numb to it, um, but you're really trying to engage people. And you, you also do that with your group with Project Trio. Um, you guys are really interested in kind of tearing down that fourth wall. How do you think you do that so effectively? Um, well, we go about it in many ways. We are super in tune with our audience. Um, we want our audience to have a good time. And so we like even design our tunes to not be too long. Mm -hmm. We only have a couple of slow tunes. We try to keep things up and moving. We kind of, we try to do as many different genres as we can get away with. So even if you didn't like anything we played, maybe you liked that one that we did, you Mm -hmm. know, even if it was the slow one or whatever. Um, And so as a street performer, um, I've been street performing since I was a teenager and when you're like young and cute or whatever, you can really rake it in mm-hmm. because people think that's really something, you know. Um, but you learn a bit about, you know, an audience when you're a street performer because um, basically no one's there to see you. They're there to do something else or go right. somewhere else. And so you learn a couple of tricks to get into people's minds and heads to get them to notice you. Um, even like? Well, you can play in the tempo people are walking huh. uh, and uh, uh, eyeball people, mm-hmm. eyebrow people, yeah. you know. And uh, 
uh, if you can get them in with one tune and then switch a genre, and they're like, oh, that Telemon is so nice. And you're like, you ain't seen nothing yet. Right. And then you <laughs> lay some beatbox or some salsa on them. They're like, oh, my gosh. And uh, so uh, those are tricks uh, I've been using for years. Uh, our, t- our crew is all about that, too. Um, also, we do something we call talking music. Um, I've noticed that a lot of artists aren't great at talking to their mm-hmm. audience. Yeah. You know, it's not it's not taught a lot, uh, frankly. And uh, it can be a little aggravating if you don't have your instrument and you're just talking mm-hmm. like it's difficult. Mm-hmm. It's a, as a difficult a skill as playing an instrument. And we decided that uh, we wanted to be talking in front of people during our shows. So we developed what we call talking music, where two of us would play while the other person talked. And it's amazing what having a backup track does for your talking. You're talking about the next thing and you can just like make up whatever you want. It don't even matter because the the guys playing behind you, they give you phrasing. They give you like, uh, you know, periods with scene. which to breathe. Yeah. yeah, or like the mood and, uh, and uh, helps crack jokes and things like this. Uh, and you don't have to feel like you keep talking, 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 you mm-hmm. kind of relax while you talk. And so uh, I really like talking music. I wish more groups did this, even uh, a classical group that doesn't know much about improv or just making up music. This is a great place to do it because really the person talking is getting all of the attention. Mm-hmm. And so the people behind can just be whiling out a little bit, doing not a whole lot. It's just cycling through a couple of chords. It right. doesn't have to be amazing, you know. It can just be a vamp or, or something. Uh, one person vamps, one person light soloing. Uh, and this really helps the speaker. I think it really helps the audience. And again, I think this is what uh, breaks the fourth wall. Gets you to know a little bit about everyone's personality. Sure. And uh, I, I think it helps the audience. That's one thing we do. Yeah. How did the three of you get introduced to each other and, and come up with the idea for your group? The three of us met in conservatory. We were all in Cleveland together, and we was just friends, and hanging out. Kind of out. happenstance that you all live in Brooklyn now? Was that something that you consciously did together? Well, or? so, yeah, so then we all went different places. I moved out of Ohio. Uh, Peter got involved in... Uh, in uh, what's that program down in Miami for the orchestra? New musician. World. New World, yeah. thanks. Yeah, and uh, Eric stayed in Cleveland, and he was subbing with all these great orchestras. He was principal of Canton, things mm-hmm. like this. And uh, I moved out to New York um, with my girlfriend at the time, my now wife, and uh, I was having a hard time meeting musicians that saw things the way I did, and um, I'd still stayed in touch with Eric a lot. And I, I, I convinced him to move to New York. Wow. I said, I, man, I can't, I have nothing. I play on the street. I yeah. play in the subway, you know, but like if you came here, you know, I'm selling these $5 CDs. Maybe we could sell it for 10 bucks. <laughs> you know, I don't know. And, uh, and I, he did it. He sold his stuff. He moved to Jersey City. And every Saturday I went over to his place and we recorded in his living room. We made a demo CD and we were playing in the subways and doing really well. It was really exciting. Um, And then right. uh, Him and Peter had been in touch a lot. They'd been in the Colorado Music Festival in Mm -hmm. Boulder and um, they'd been doing a lot of kind of duo recitals outside of the orchestra work where they would use a loop pedal or jam jazz changes, just the two of them. And so they were thinking of, they were the ones with the name Project and were trying to put this group together. The idea being everyone has a project in their head, this thing they want to be doing. Even if you work for a big ensemble, there's maybe something else that you're trying to do with your music. And so that was the nature of Project. We wanted to do education, the way we saw education mm-hmm. ought to be. We wanted to do performance the way we saw performance to be. And um, we, uh, right as my uh, videos hit, Peter was subbing for a year in Cleveland with the orchestra. And uh, we were all talking. He knew Eric moved to New York and we were hanging out together. And he said he didn't win the job. He took that audition. And so he moved to New York too. And we... That was it. Yeah. We, we started doing it together. Uh, I had a hot video on Google 
or on YouTube. Uh, we got a job playing at a really scandalous club downtown. We were the St. Petersburg Chamber Orchestra, even though it was just the three of us. <laughs> and uh, every night, you know, six nights a week, we would play. We'd go on at one or two in the morning and play crazy music. Yeah. And uh, it took us about, we did that for about eight months. And then by then, finally, our, our gigs synced up. You know, in the classical or rather chamber music world, you book these gigs really far in advance. Mm-hmm. You don't just call the hall a couple of weeks ahead and say, hey, man, you got any, <laughs> got any room? Right. And it's contract work. So you set it up, and then eight months later, a year later, you go and show up. And uh, and it all worked out. Here we are now. Yeah. It's 11 years later, and we're still doing it. We got a brand new CD even. It's about to drop, nice. uh, I believe, next Wednesday. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. Congrats. That's great. Thanks. It's yeah. our sixth one. Uh, it's, uh, it was really awesome. Yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit more about education because you were sharing about your, um, you know, education as you see fit and how you think it should be done. You guys do have a post grad um, program that you're you're running mm-hmm. in 21st century chamber music and entrepreneurship. That's right. Um, what are your goals with that, and uh, can you explain a little bit about the program? Sure. Well, uh, we we offer a program here in New York City, um, and you have to come to New York, and you have to find a place to live. Um, but if you can get here and do that, um, we offer uh, classes many times a week. It lasts six to eight weeks, kind of kind of changes uh, every year. And then we offer help with uh, business plans, with uh, filling in all of the gaps of music education, mm-hmm. which I can go into in a bit. <laughs> um, and we give people kind of modern help uh, in terms of media. So we help them shoot videos. We teach about audio, uh, lighting. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a great relationship with YouTube because of our channel. Yep. Um, and in fact, our last album was made at YouTube Studios, which we get because we have a, a large subscriber base so we get free access to those studios last year we got to bring in these fellows into the studio we sh- everyone got to shoot their own videos we did group videos and we talk a lot about concepts like improvisation or a role approached base to music making mm-hmm. uh, classical musicians usually uh, make all the music writing happen with the composers which is totally fine Um, But if you reflect a bit on our favorite composers from back in the day, most of these cats were also performers. In fact, they were composing music for them to play so they could put food on their table. You know, that's just how it was. And along the way, maybe over the past hundred years, uh, we've really lost that. Uh, And there's been a lot of interest in bringing that back, that we have uh, composers slash performers. Mm -hmm. Just reading some interviews you've done, I I noticed that you've kind of emphasized the importance of having a almost childlike approach to playing, um, being open-minded and being unafraid of failure and just kind of going for it. Um, Mm -hmm. Do you think that you were always that way or did after having a family, did you kind of come into that way of thinking and really learn from them how to approach your music in a new way? No, I've, I've always been like that. Uh, Being a dad has been, a great gift and allows me to explore music in a totally different way with uh, youth that I'm normally not around. Like I don't really outreach to two year olds, you Mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Uh, But now I get to. Uh, And as they go through the stages, it's fun to play the music. Um, Do they like what you do? They, I'm not sure, Uh, you know, (laughs) I don't know. Um, You know, I would always play for their classes and such Mm. and, Everyone else would always like it, and the kids, my kids, they don't always like it. But uh, um, at home, I don't play too much flute around them, but I do play. Also, I bought a violin two years ago, and I'm trying to teach myself violin. I'm on a 10 year plan. Okay? <laughs> okay. So I got eight more years. Maybe we should get a teacher. Well, <laughs> I some... took one lesson, yeah. and I got so upset about it yeah. because. It turns out I'm really, really particular about how I'm taught. Mm -hmm. And I want to do it my way. I want to learn my way. Now, uh, and I want to fail my way. And so, um, and I think I've always been like that. 
uh, and I've always been very stubborn, but but willing to accept if someone ideas are better, I'm, I'm going to take them. You know, if someone says, well, you suck because this X, Y and Z and I can actually hear it. I'll be like, you, so were you are right. Were you like a Let's... notoriously difficult student for I mean, what does Josh Smith really think? No, of you? <laughs> I have no idea. I'm sure he thinks that everything's cool. Yeah. I, he, he's such an amazing player. He was an, uh, an excellent teacher. I, I enjoyed studying with him. It's just hilarious that mm-hmm. I'm not really known for that sound. Yeah. You know, really, although I can actually I know how to get that sound right. if I care to. Um, but doing a big diaphragmatic keep the line, you know, hall filling sound, believe it or not, uh, is not good for beatbox flute always. Mm-hmm. I wear a lot of hats when I play. I got to go between a lot of styles. But in beatbox, you're hyperventilating a lot. And so even though we're looking for this full like a uh, chest voice type flute sound um, from the classical uh, reality, um, because I'm hyperventilating, I'm doing basically a head tone sound. And so I'm opening in different places in the head than I would for classical music. And I'm finding different places of resistance than I would for classical music. And so I will pass out if I'm that open mm-hmm. when I'm doing all my rhythmic stuff because I'm moving so much air in and out so fast. Instead of keeping the line on one big breath, I'm breathing constantly throughout the bar mm-hmm. uh, really fast. Um, You're talking about your violin. Now, now I'm curious oh, where that's well, headed. Well, um, so this is back to the, maybe the, well, it turns out, because I started flute in the fourth grade, I do all these things subconsciously on the flute. Like, we learn to rip on the flute. Our job is to play all of the fast notes. Mm-hmm. We play fast. That's what we do. And I learned to play all my scales fast at a very young age. And I can do it. I used to sit in front of the mirror and look at my fingers and say, man, I can't even believe I'm doing that. I have no idea what I'm doing. And there I am doing it. And uh, so I've internalized all this music. And it's hard sometimes to like bring it into the conscious mind. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I think about things as a flute player does. And so... Um, uh, I, when I think about an A, I think about a left hand, yeah. thumb, first finger, middle finger, and I see it on the page. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's A. But on a violin, that is not A. Okay, A lives somewhere totally different in the fingers and in the mind. And so playing something like the violin uh, totally reinforces my concept of music theory of how pitches go together and about uh, certain vamps, ideas, improvisational concepts end up working totally different on the violin. And so it's also, I can't do anything on the violin. Like, you know, like I do nothing (laughs) subconsciously. Everything is like this big brained Mm -hmm. like event. And so I can play the flute in front of a thousand people and not have to warm up because I can just do it. But I can warm up on the violin for half an hour and still bang my head against the mm-hmm. wall because it's not like yesterday. And why? I don't know, <laughs> you know. Um, and so this is such a, a positive way to move your music forward. And I really stress other people, um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're passionate about music, get another instrument. And it doesn't even have to be a different instrument, like fully, like flute and violin. I play saxophone too. And, you know, uh, always growing up, people said, don't play saxophone. It'll mess with your lips. Yeah. All right. And and I listened to my teachers and I'm mad I did because mm-hmm. I wish I'd played the saxophone earlier because, I mean, A, I could have gotten work on it. Yeah. You know, like being a doubler would be yeah. awesome. And uh, in the end, this is these are all muscles. Yep. Muscles regenerate. Yeah, it's not like you shattering bones playing I was in the, the saxophone. same boat. Yeah, I used to play both um, back in like middle school, I think, because I wanted to play in jazz band. Mm-hmm. So I did both, and then eventually a teacher told me you gotta you gotta stop playing saxophone. It's gonna ruin your flute embouchure. Yeah, you should quit. So yeah. I said, oh, all right, I'll quit. But you know, that's such a that's only a classical perspective would tell you that mm-hmm. because there are so many famous jazz flute players exactly. that were actually yes. sax players yeah. and they can do things on the flute that a classical flutist can't even wrap their mind around. Mm-hmm. How do you articulate like that? Well, classical flutists would never do that because they don't know anything about like anchor tonguing or like how you doodle tongue on a sax or yeah. anything like that. And so then you got all these cool jazz musicians doing cool stuff on the flute, which you will never access unless you get a little access 
to saxophone. So the saxophone notes honk out on the bottom. And the flute notes honk out on the top. Yeah. So on a flute, I go ba ba da 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 be da 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 be da da da. But on a saxophone, I would go ba ba da 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 ba da 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 ba da da da. And that's a very sax sound. Well, I would never approach these intervals like that on the flute that way. But now it turns out I've just been skimping on that, right? Yeah. So like working with the sax teaches you all about uh, how to really support. Like you might think you're supporting on the flute, but if you are not diaphragmatically supporting on the sax it does not work right and you can feel it because you are pushing against it and there's this great push that happens and your sound opens up and you're like aha and now i will do that on the flute check <laughs> this out yeah. you know it's like the kind of stuff your teacher tells you about all the time and until it actually happens you know light the bulb. light bulb yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. so um uh i am still finding all sorts of holes in my music, which I'm trying to fill with other instruments. I am constantly trying to learn. Now we have this wonderful thing I did have growing up called the internet. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I w- I'm reading this great book on a, on a flute player, or maybe think of him as a sax player called Brisson Roland Kirk. I don't know if you guys know who this guy is. He was very famous back in the day for playing three saxophones at the same time. Um, and he, he'd keep a little flute in his tenor. <laughs> and then he'd, he was this blind guy, man. He was real psychedelic. And he'd, then he'd move all the saxophones aside and blow the flute. And he played it so cool. And I'm reading this book all about him. And in the book, it says this album. And he played with this guy. And now I can immediately go to iTunes and get that album and, mm-hmm. re- and hear this guy. And it was such a chore growing up getting information, finding records, finding things, you know, you... Even from the pop reality, you'd hear the single and you'd have to go buy the whole album to yeah, get the single. Yeah. But now you could just get the single, you know, like um, there's so much. So infor- for you, it's a it's a big positive because oh, a lot of people man, think it can it, be a negative. It's it, too easy to get whatever you want. No, it's at, the, at your fingertips. Wonderful for yeah. me because I am passionate about getting better at music. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, I know all my limitations is what practicing is, Mm -hmm. you know, is finding out your problems and slowly chipping away at fixing those problems. And it's brutal, grueling work. But at the end of the day, it'll help you play a little bit better, a little bit every day. Mm -hmm. And so the internet, man, it, it helps me grow. I don't hang out with too many beatboxers. I got a busy touring schedule. I'm a dad. Yeah. I got a whole family life cracking. Um, but I can cue up beatboxers talking about beatboxing and learn sounds. Mm-hmm. I can learn about Indian classical music. I can totally consume all sorts of jazz. Violin is such a uh, external instrument. Everything they do, you can see. Flute yeah. is internal. It takes a bit to understand when you hear someone's tone, what they're doing with the back of their tongue or what they're doing with the roof of their mouth or even what they're doing with their throat. But you can learn to hear it and picture that. But now I can watch Hilary Hahn play violin mm-hmm. and be like, oh, that's how she does it. That doesn't mean I can do it, but at least I have a clear image. This was next to impossible back in the day. Yeah. Where are you going to see a violinist? you got to go to a show and see a violinist. And how are you going to remember that the next day? It's very difficult. So I'm stoked about the <laughs> internet, yo. It is the best. And I'm going to learn that violin without a teacher, too. Yeah, I was going to say, we're going to have to check in with you in 10 years, see oh, how man. this plan goes. I got ideas on this yeah. thing, man. I, I'm already, I got my three octave scale in G already. I got a couple Good of shifts you. cracking. Yeah. yeah, yeah. My vibrato is lacking, but we're <laughs> working on it. I play a lot. That's what I do with the kids. I play that violin. Well, thanks so much for coming in. Uh, it was really a treat getting to chat with you and look forward to see what's in the future. Yo, right on. All right. All right. I can't wait to see just how far Greg makes it on violin and, of course, his flute and what he's up to next with Project Trio. Their newest album, Six Floor Live, is out on iTunes now. Thanks to Greg Patillo for sitting down with me. Songs include Now, Symphony No. 5 Jam, and Yardbird Suite.
This has been an episode of Flute Unscripted. This podcast is sponsored by the Flute Center of New York. Visit our website at flutesforsale.com for the largest selection of new and pre-owned instruments. Remember to use this podcast promo code LISTEN for discounts on flutes and sheet music. Special thanks to our owner, Phil Unger, the Flute Center team, and Stefan Huskolson for our theme music.